All right, folks. So we've got Andrew Reid back on the podcast. Andrew uh, knocked it out of the park before Christmas with his podcast episode. We've got a lot of really good feedback. And today we're going to be going deeper on physical health and emotional health specifically. So, Andrew, do you want to quickly, just for people who don't know, quick background about who you are, and then we'll jump into the, the themes of today. I've been training people for about 30 years. And I think one of the things, and, and I've done, you know, high performance and fat loss and all the stuff that that you would think you could cover in that kind of time. And my initial interest was always in high performance. And so I tend to think I'm like a Formula One mechanic who's now working on the family car. And well, actually more like a vintage car because I specialize in 40 year old plus guys. So um, I, I'm like a classic race car mechanic at this point. Um, but somewhere along the way, I started to realize that the most important stuff, like the training side of stuff is pretty basic. Like, you know, for the vast majority of people out there, you could just go do name any PT course, right? To get certified. You've actually probably got enough knowledge just from that course to train the vast majority of people. But there are still times where you can't get a good result with someone and you realize that the result is not because of their lack of desire or for your lack of education and ability. It's because there's something there in terms of uh, their emotions, their their habit building process, something that's gone on psychologically for them to a large degree when they were younger. We talked about this in the previous one, but you know, like as a little kid, you stubbed your toe and your parents gave you some ice cream or something to quiet you down. Well, congratulations. They just screwed up your relationship with food for life. Because what you learned was that when you're sad, you should get a treat. But you also get the opposite happen where, I don't know, you scored a goal in a soccer match or you got a great mark in a school test and you got a treat as well. And so now you've got a doubly screwed up relationship because you've also learned that when things go well, you get a treat with food. And you know, like you might get 40, 50 years down the track and have no idea why you're even doing these things. And as an example, I've got a, a client who, and, and, and he's a conscientious, hardworking guy. He's sincere. I, I've got no reason to believe he's lying about things, but he couldn't really, we, we made some progress with fat loss, but couldn't get anywhere. And I said, like, I really feel like you'd benefit from going and speaking to someone about it. There was clearly when he was, um, when he would do things with his family, you could tell there was some angst there. Like, so, and we all have a little bit of angst around our family, right? Mm -hmm. And he's gone off and he started speaking to a therapist and they're talking about stuff from when he was six or seven years old. And, it, it, and the guy's in his mid forties and it shows you how deep seated so much of this stuff is. So, I guess as you travel along the journey, you realize that the physical side of things is actually relatively easy to help people with. The basic mechanics of diet are relatively easy. Like, I mean, math is math, you know, like, and it, if you lifted seven reps this week and six last week, you've made an improvement. Like that, that's all actually pretty simple stuff. But being able to figure out how to ask people the questions to get them to think about why they're doing stuff, that's actually become a much bigger part of my job. And it can be very frustrating because, you know, obviously as you work with more and more people, you just go, oh, this is the problem right here. But if I just tell you what the problem is and tell you what to do, you have no ownership of that. I need you to understand what you're doing, why you're doing it, and then I need you to come up with an answer for it because now you've got buy into that plan. And that that's the hardest part is is figuring out what the question is to ask someone to get them to think about it, to get them to change the thing. Yes, this is, uh, yeah, like, I think as a coach, you can start assuming, or even you know the answer, but that doesn't really matter because you want the person to see it through their eyes and also see how they should best approach it. Um, yeah, yeah, it, it, it's no good if you provide the solution for them. Right? I mean, this is, and everybody who's who's ever trained anyone knows, like at some point you gave away some sessions to someone because you, you just felt it was the right thing to do because they had no money or I don't know, they were really down and out or depressed or and you just wanted to help them and they blew it off. 
because they had no value attached to it. And it's the same with a solution to anything. If they don't have buy into it, if it's, if it's not their idea, their, um, their acceptance of it and their, um, like just their, their work ethic towards fixing it is so much lower. You've, it, it has to be their idea. And that's really tricky to get people to, to come to those conclusions on their own. Well, not on their own, but with some assistance. Yeah. I'd like to, you know, you're just saying there about, you know, referring some to a therapist and just seeing the pattern that, okay, I'm doing all the right things as a coach, but this is kind of beyond my wheelhouse. This guy, maybe there's something going on there from a, an emotional standpoint. When did you start changing or this thought process started? You're like, okay, maybe I'm going to start referring clients or maybe there's more going on here than just, you know, calories, macros, training and, and habits. I think, um, you know, it, great desire for everyone always to appear like they've got all the answers, particularly, you know, like as, as a trainer, you want to, you want the person to keep spending money with you is the bottom line. Like every business wants that customer to stay inside their house, giving them money rather than potentially seeing it go somewhere else. And so there's this, this idea that if I say, I don't know something that I'm going to lose face, but the opposite is actually true. And I mean, I'll give you an example. Even today, I spoke to a guy this morning. He would have made a terrific client. This guy's, I mean, middle-aged. He owns a, he actually owns a confectionery company. So I'm like, oh my God, this is going to be amazing at Christmas time. Um, <laughs> but owns a confectionery company. He's divorced, but he's realized he's, he's out of shape. And when I say out of shape, so he's about 40 kilo overweight, type two diabetic. He actually had four strokes about two years ago, like in the middle of COVID. So imagine how scary that was to mm. have to go through hospitalization in the middle of COVID. And he actually said he went blind for about a day and a half immediately afterwards, which would have been terrifying, right? Like like thinking, oh my, like I'm going to die. I can't see my family. Like, so this guy's been through a lot, but he's very mindful about where he's at, about what needs to change. He's seeking out help. And honestly, I could do all of it except for the stroke part. I've never trained anyone who's had a stroke before. Heart attacks, yes, strokes, no. Uh, and, and But I've got a friend who actually had a heart attack and had five strokes. And amazingly, he's a world powerlifting champion as well. And in his, because he obviously couldn't compete anymore in the, the lull between all the strokes, he realized he had a brain injury, which this guy also has. And he went back to university, studied neuroscience. So he's actually got a degree in neuroscience now, spurred on by his own past. And I said, you know what? Like, I mean, I could do most of this. I've been really successful with diabetics. I've helped plenty of people lose weight. Like all that stuff's easy. But the stroke thing, I just know this guy who's so much better suited for you than I'm going to be. And I referred him out. And worst case scenario, I don't ever earn a cent off this guy. But at some point... I'm going to get something back, whether he refers another friend to me or something like that. But he, I mean, really tough to let him go because he would have been such a great client, but I just knew that I actually know someone better for you. And it's the same with the, the psychological stuff is I've got, I mean, if you can see my bookshelf behind me, I have an entire shelf that's just mindset and psych books, like habit building and stuff like that. But I don't have a degree in it. I certainly don't have a master's or anything like it. I've done a bunch of, it's called CBT, cognitive behavioral mm -hmm. therapy, uh, reading and coaching courses and things like that. So like, I'm not bad at it, but I'm, I'm an amateur, you know, like, like and, and when I've gone through all my tricks, it's time, you know, like, like, like if I can't get a result, then I have to refer you out. And I see good physios do it. I see, you know what I mean? Like good GPs will do it. And there's no reason why a good trainer shouldn't do it as well. It just stings a little bit, you know, like in the short term, it's like, oh, I really wish that person was still spending money with me, but it's the right thing to do. Yeah, it's like, I think that abundance mindset is very hard at the start because you're like, for me anyway, I was very much in a scarcity mindset, like trying to build my business. But I think- oh, Especially when you're new and you're scrambling for clients, absolutely. Yeah, but like- I guess this is maybe a good way to go. Like when you're, when we are a career PT, you know, all this stuff will come back or you'll burn so many bridges going forwards from always trying to money grab. Well, I think that's it, a, 
and, and, and I always feel like as well, like there are things that I, I had a client once, and, and again, very ambitious guy, super hardworking and keen cyclist. So obviously he and I shared that. And I was looking at his heart rate data one day and his heart rate shot up like over 200 beats for this brief period during the ride. I'm like, that's a really strange thing to have happened. So I asked him about it. He goes, oh yeah, I've had AF for years. And, you know, my doctor keeps telling me to slow down. Ha, 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 ha. Wants to put me on medication. You know, it's not a big deal. I'm like, no, that's an incredibly big deal because that What's leads AF to strokes. Uh, atrial fibrillation. So it's the heart just starts beating super fast in an uncontrolled fashion. The danger is that because the heart's not beating fully, it's not pumping blood out of the left ventricle, right? blood pulls very quickly. Like when you you don't keep it moving, it actually congeals super fast. And so you can create a stroke from this. So it, it is super dangerous what this guy was doing. And he said, oh, and he was a financial guy. Like he had a company with a few hundred employees doing like about $40 million worth of business a year, like, like super high stress environment. And he goes, oh yeah, it happens a couple of times a year. Like, like, this period that we're in now and ha 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 no big deal and I was like no no it's a super big deal and I really need you to listen to a cardiologist and you absolutely need to take the medication and we went back and forth for a period of weeks and it kept happening and finally after you know like about the third or fourth time over about an eight-week period I just said look I, I can't do this because the worst case scenario for me is that you die on a training ride that I put in your program for you. And all all the intensity had been removed. Everything was like moderate, steady state, zone two, math kind of stuff. But worst case scenario for me is you die and your family now turns around and sues me because you're on a training ride that I sent you on and I'm not having that. And the same thing goes for the guy with the stroke. Like I could have done 95% of the stuff he needed but there's always that question mark. I'm not a specialist in that stuff. And no matter how many like Google pages I read about how to train someone with a stroke, I'm, I'm definitely have no experience with it. The worst case scenario is I actually kill someone and that's not worth any amount of money. Yeah, mate. Um, have you found like, as you've gotten more, you know, very much like forties plus men, and that's like all the people you've been working with. So I'm guessing there's quite a few guys in their 60s that are coming to work with you. Yeah, I hear, I mean, just, it's actually, I find it to be one of the hardest parts of, of what I do now is the conversations I have with people who are potential customers. The, the heartbreak over divorce, the heart attacks, the back and knee injuries, the just the the general uh like negative vibe they've got about where they're at how they're feeling where their life is at so many guys just i mean a staggering amount in that kind of 45 to 55 bracket heart attacks strokes like like serious problems and i, I mean i'm 52 and, and and so many of these guys are younger than me and I mean, the guy I talked to today, the strokes and the diabetes and stuff, uh, his cousin had had all the same stuff, but had actually died and was even younger than this guy. So, I mean, like like for him, like you could feel the pain of, of where he was at and the knowledge that, hey, this, this thing could kill me if I don't fix it. Like it, that's actually really hard to speak to people about because, I mean, what are you going to say? Like your life's been changed irreparably by the choices you made in the first 40 years. And we can do, I mean, imagine being a demolition derby car and then someone comes along and wants to shine you up to be a show car. Like that's that's what we're trying to do. And it, you can make some changes, but the system's been irreparably damaged at that point. There's, there's you know, you, you can't fix everything from there. It's, it's and, and people are hoping I'm going to wave my personal trainer magic wand and make all that stuff go away. That's, that's really difficult, but certainly... I see as I get older, definitely the choices you make in the first 40 to 50 years, they are really coming home to roost after that. So hopefully you made some good choices and not all bad ones, but the the negative side effects of stuff, I mean, every day I speak, every day I speak to someone who has had a heart attack, a stroke, something that's that's like irreparable. Yeah. 
Have you, like, I guess the, I'd like to just talk about the emotional health side of things for, you know, there's a lot of talk about men's mental health, everything in recent years. Um, but also the way to approach it is not necessarily always the same as with women, like how to be treated. So do you think physical training is a really good vehicle for a lot of men to start from, uh, you know, changing mood, to all these things? Like, what's your perspective there? Yeah, look, it can be. I mean, the I think exercise is a little bit like first aid. You know, if you think about the role of first aid, it, there's actually something that goes before first aid, which is called self-aid. If you think about that Dr. ABC thing, the first thing is danger, right? Like, make sure you're not in danger before you go through the responsiveness and airways and all the other stuff that goes with with first aid, check out yourself first. I've not met anyone, and again, I speak to a lot of guys every year, I've not met anyone who's overweight, who's happy. So, mm. you know, like they may outwardly project that, but when you speak to them privately about what their fears and concerns are, you just hear a lot of unhappiness. And and so when you can look in the mirror and actually be pleased with yourself, I think it makes a lot of other things easier. It certainly makes your interactions with other people easier. You tend to be a lot more patient. When you're more patient and calm with people, you get, I mean, it's not just the relationships with people close to you, but you have better relationships with people at work, which maybe means you can get promoted and earn more money and make more sales and all these different things. So Certainly, it's the start of it. I think there is definitely a culture, though. Like, if I look at my top social media posts, my top social media posts are basically me calling people fat and lazy. And not not in those words, because if you actually said fat on Facebook, you get banned. But, but you know, like, like but that's the, the essence of those posts. Yeah. If you did that in female fitness, that post would bomb and you would lose thousands of followers because female fitness is very much supportive, nurturing. Um, we're all sisters in this together kind of thing. Male fitness, if you look at the the highest ranking male figures, like David Goggins and people like that, is basically insulting people, calling them lazy mm. and weak. That, for some reason, is what men tend to resonate with. Um, that's just the culture we're brought up with, perhaps in the Western world. But there's then this idea that, um, you know, we should be using workouts as like a when the day's been hard and you're tired and, you know, like just go to the gym and do this cathartic workout and sweat it out and rah. And that could be the straw that broke the camel's back. I mean, if you're already low on sleep, you've eaten poorly, you've had a really high stress day at work, you don't need to go and add stress through a workout, you need to go for a walk and do something like loving to yourself. So somewhere between this, you know, you do need to get in better shape because you'll certainly be happier with yourself and that's going to make a lot of other things easier. But you also have to balance it with, you shouldn't be going and doing something super stressful to yourself when you've already had a stressful day. I mean, as an example, a client of mine had to put his dog down, unfortunately, two weeks ago. And the in his like the diet sheet that I use allows a lot of customer feedback where they can write about their week and different things. And he's like, Oh, you know, I'm just being lazy and weak. And, you know, I can't believe I've been this effective. I'm like, Whoa. Like, I, I, I don't know about where you are, but in Australia, your pet actually counts for bereavement leave. So you, you could put mm. into your employer that you need four days off or something after having put your dog down and that's legal. So if you went to work and you had a staff member saying, Oh, Oh, I'm just such a weak bastard, you know. I'm, I'm sorry I'm letting the team down. I'm, I've, I've put my dog down in 15 years or whatever who was there when my kids moved out, my wife left me and, you know, like, and I lost my previous job and, and he was my best mate and, I, and I'm just sorry I'm so weak. You'd cut the guy some slack. And so many people fail to cut themselves slack when they really need to and they just go and make it worse. And so like, this guy I said to him, like, just don't eat all the ice cream in the world. Like, you know, the, the diet stuff will be there in a couple of weeks. We down-tuned his workouts and it's now, it's nearly three weeks. He's starting to come through the worst of it now and starting to be a little bit more focused again. But under normal circumstances, like if you put down a loved one, whether it's a pet or a person close to you, 
you shouldn't be expected to go and have the hardest workout yet that's male fitness culture is this this mm. go hard or go home mentality is still there so we, we definitely need to get through to people's head that you know it's a fine balancing act between carrot and stick but there there are probably more carrot days than there are stick days really yeah yeah it's definitely i think it depends like i think a lot of people just need to actually start doing something like with yeah. <laughs> any sort of mental health stuff like if you're feeling really anxious or depressed or or whatever it is uh, or you you know if you haven't been sleeping well you've been eating crap food you haven't moved properly and you're stressed out of your head at work you should feel mentally unwell like when all those things aren't well, you, working yeah, you, you're, you're you're you'll definitely feel grumpy like that absolutely you know even for those of us who like exercise regularly and and mostly watch what they eat like you know you'll even recognize it if you spend a whole weekend doing nothing and eating some pizza and cookies or whatever you get to monday and you'd be so ready to eat a salad and hit the gym anyway because you recognize how poorly you feel but for people who are doing it 24 7 365 they don't actually realize how bad they feel it's not until you can break that cycle for at least a couple of weeks that they start to recognize that hey this, this going is better on time thing. That's actually really good. Like, I can't believe how much better I feel on eight hours sleep than five, you know, or, mm-hmm. or drinking some water every day. That stuff's amazing. Like, you know, like, but, but, but you've got to have them do it long enough to recognize, again, it has to be their recognition of it. It has to be their decision that they go, oh, that thing's really important. i got to keep doing that thing. Yeah. And then there's the other end of it, which, yeah, a lot of, um, online sources would be like you know the, the gym is the is my therapy and everything like that which it can be helpful but then there's certain situations like you literally just need yeah, to go and see and, a, a professional and, and there's the, the instagram fitness thing and guys and i'm going to call them out guys like andrew huberman and peter adia who were just filled with bad information like there's so much cherry-picked nonsense in what they do but I was on LinkedIn the other day and someone I'm connected to is connected to this young GP in Singapore. And this guy's posted a picture of him lifting weights. And when I looked at his bio, he was a personal trainer before he became a doctor. The guy's obviously super hard working, all that kind of stuff to put yourself through med school while working as a personal trainer must be tricky. Mm. Um, But he's like, oh, you know, it's really important. You never break the habit. Even when you've had hard days, make sure you hit the gym. I'm like, that's just such unrealistic stuff to say to people and I get it because you're like 25 years old but hopefully you're going to come back in about a decade and you're going to look back at this post and realize what terrible advice that is to a 40 year old or something who's up to their eyeballs in stress because what you should be saying to them is for god's sake go home and eat something healthy go for a walk and then have an early night that's the best thing to do when you've had a really stressful day trying to have the workout of your life under those conditions is counterproductive for so many reasons yeah, yeah, yeah. And then you push yourself, you get hurt, and then you're you're in that cycle, that all in, all out mentality. But it, it, the super compensation curve, right? So you're aware of what it looks like, but for people who aren't aware, so here I am at baseline, I train and I actually go like this. I get worse, right? Because there's a recovery process. And after that, I come back above baseline and eventually will return to baseline. And so obviously the goal is that over time, what you're actually doing is this. You're super compensating and slowly rising so that viewed with a big picture look, you're just improving. But that super compensation curve is is not just dependent on the workout, but on all the other factors. It's your diet, it's your sleep, it's your overall stress. So here I am, I'm actually starting to head down already because I'm so stressed out. And now I train, I just dug a deeper hole for myself. So under a normal amount of super compensation, I will come back, I won't even be back at baseline. So all you're actually doing is digging a deeper hole that might take even longer to get out of rather than give up five or six days because you got hurt or injured, like you said. Maybe we just give up one day now. And I would rather give up one day each week if I have to than we give up entire weeks at a time or maybe like the the guys talking about with the, the cyclist and the atrial fibrillation, the thing that actually preceded all of that was he got covid And at the time, all of my North American clients with COVID were over it within two weeks. He was still sick more than two months later because every time he started feeling a little bit better, he'd go out and have one of these hard rides, smash himself and go Mm. back below the baseline again. And 
that was when I, I really started paying attention to what he was like. I mean, I was watching obviously, but then I started looking individually at heart rate stuff within his training. I'm like, well, not only have you had COVID and you're still getting better from that, but now we've got this other thing we need to pay attention to. And it was just clear that he didn't want to do anything sensible. He just wanted to smash himself. And, you know, like, like the hole he dug from it was so deep that he could have been over it in two weeks. And eight weeks later, he was still struggling with with this thing that was wasn't. I mean, let's be honest, it was just a serious flu. The what he had, um, you know, just anyway. Don't, don't dig a deeper hole. That's that's the the main thing people should be doing. Your choice, and this goes for diet too. When you're faced with a tough time, you got a series of choices in front of you. Take a deep breath, so you remove the emotion from it. And you move the spontaneity and you have a, ch a chance to sit and calmly react to things. But choose your response based on not making your life any worse than it is now. Right. So, so it, sometimes you can't have a choice that makes it better. Right. Like like you're just going to have to eat shit because like of where you are. Like there's there's no alternative but make a choice that's not going to make your life any worse than it is now. Because so often people will be facing that shit situation. They go, oh, fuck it. It's not perfect. I'm going to eat crap. I'm going to stay up late. I'm going to like drink a bottle of bourbon with it. And now you've just made three choices that have definitely made your life worse. But you have an opportunity to make your life no worse, at least by the next choice you make. So remove the emotion from it. Take the time to think about it. And you'll probably find that your first response to things, particularly for guys, is going to be not the right response. Yeah, 100%. Uh, how do you thread that line? People are coming into your program. Let's just say they've come in for 12 weeks or I'm not sure how long the, the, the minimum would be, but they've financially invested. They're excited. Then you go through the background and everything and they're like red light, you know, burnt out and they want to go on this, you know, fat loss or, you know, a high intensity journey or whatever. How do you coach people through that, that like, you know, going slow right now is actually going to be the, the shortcut for them over the long term? Yeah. I mean, again, you've got to phrase it in a way that makes them realize that they came to this conclusion, like just going, Hey man, you need to slow down. That That's not going to do anything, but you know, a more sensible person using the the guy I just used an example. So if if I said that to most people, I'm going, hey, so uh, not sure you knew, but I, I train a bunch of people in your country, and quite a few have had COVID, and the average time for them to get over it was two weeks. And when I look back, I see that it's taken you eight weeks. What do you think is causing that? And obviously, this is a really slow way to go about things. So old school PT, and particularly my age group. And anyone who's in the military is just used to being told, like, do this, bark, 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 bark. You know, like, here's what you're going to do. I don't care if you like it. Just go do that. That's not a great way to get a response from most people. You'll get a, a small percentage of people will, will respond to that, and which is the guys who actually were in the military or wanted to join the military. And then mm. the entire rest of the population won't get a good result with that. So you've slowly got to bring them around to it. And again, it's, it's really frustrating because – in your head, you know it would be faster if you just told them what to do, but it'd only be faster for today. You actually need them to to come to this conclusion on their own. So the I mean, the number one comment I send to customers is add weight to things because I I, I can just tell people are cruising based on you know like how many reps they got from an exercise this week versus last week and so on going back. But the next one after that will be a question about, oh, so you know, I notice you generally miss Wednesdays. Like what's going on on Tuesday night, for instance, that sees you miss Wednesday morning's workout and they start to become aware of it. And it might happen four or five times that I comment on before they finally start to address that behavior. And that means that we were aware of the problem more than a month prior, but it's taken them a month for it to finally sink in that this is actually something that needs to be addressed. So very slow process, unfortunately. I mean, changing someone's mind for 40 years of habits isn't going to be an overnight process. There are some people, I've got two clients that I can think of who, when I told them, like, here's how I want you to eat. This is how I want your lifestyle set up. Just boom, did it like that. And like, like, like a light switch, like robots, you know, no one else has ever done that. 
So just these two guys happen to have the exact right personality that you can just go do this. And once they believe in something, because they've got faith in me, because they obviously purchased my services, they just bought into it a hundred percent with some people it might take them two years to actually buy into mm -hmm. what I'm saying that much. And when I used to have my gym in person, um, the existing clients who'd been there for like a year plus would watch new people come in and take bets on how long it used to, it would take me to break someone to get them to actually listen to me and pay attention to things. But it could be a year to two years to get them to, and, and all the training's going on at the same time, but to get them to finally go to sleep early and do some extra cardio and drink more water and like all these basic things that you or I might take for granted it can be a year or two to get people to buy into that fully. Yeah. Uh, are there certain things that like, I guess it's probably specific or depending on people, but what would be, let's just talk about like physical and maybe mindset. Like we don't need to say just because uh, neither of us are like qualified therapists or anything like that, but what would be one to three things you get people working on from a physical standpoint and one to three kind of habit or uh, behavioral or mindset things that would be helpful for Again, guy in his 40s or 50s, he's got at least 10 to 20 kilos to lose. And most of the guys in that kind of bucket generally do well if they start focusing on these things. The two exercises that I feel people do the worst are pull-ups and squats. Pull-ups because everyone cheats them. You know, you get these guys yeah. doing like, like starting from like a 90 degree bend at the elbow, their foreheads clearing the bar. I'm like, no, no, like fully straight to chest to bar is my standard because then you know yeah. it's a full rep right getting people to actually do full chest to bar reps is very difficult and squatting as well so and that's i mean as, as you get older you lose collagen you lose flexibility so people are losing mobility as they get older and if they're not prepared to work on it, things like squatting are going to get very difficult, even deadlifting off the floor. This is why you see a lot of older guys go to trap bars because trap bars don't require the same amount of hamstring flexibility. You don't have to get quite as low. Or maybe they'll put the bar on some plates, you know, so that the, uh, the, the bumpers that they're using will sit on like two or three inches of plate just to bring it up off the ground. Um, so the mobility side of stuff is definitely a problem. And with mindset... It's always food. Food's always the problem. And, you know, guys, uh, people think they can out-discipline a lifetime of habit. And I mean, if your mum, like my mum, makes these amazing chocolate chip cookies, she's not going to be around for too much longer. I mean, she's 83. So the, the number of chocolate chip cookies I'm going to get off my mum is, is limited, mm. right? But I can say no for a short period of time. But then we're talking about 50 years of saying yes to them. That's a really difficult thing to overcome. And unless you're prepared to do that mindset work, and when I say mindset, like habit building, uh, reviewing your behavior and identifying the behaviors that led to you make those choices, then trying to come up with a new behavior each time you're presented with that. Like, so let's just use like drinking in a social environment as an example. A lot of people just join in without even necessarily meaning to, knowing that it's not the right thing for their um, uh, for, for their the result that they're after. And yet, when you ask them, they're like, "Oh, yeah, I I, I didn't want to feel like I missed out." Well, okay, so what do you feel like you're missing out on? Like, like you know, trying to get them to investigate what they were thinking about. Like, if they're your friends, for instance does it matter if you have a drink or not? Like, will you enjoy hanging out with your friends any more or less if you don't drink with them? If the answer is you, you won't enjoy it as much, you're probably hanging out with the wrong people. Right. Yeah. And the other side of that is, and, and you come from a drinking culture as well. Like if you're hanging out with people that give you a hard time because you're not drinking with them, they're also probably the wrong people because what kind of friend gets mad at you for doing something healthy for yourself? That's not someone who loves you, right? That's not the actions of a friend. That's the actions of something else. So being able to talk to people about these things and have them examine it again with a logical framework so they can start to identify like, oh, yeah, I, I wasn't at a drinking event. I was at a social event where there happened to be alcohol. Those are two separate things. Like you didn't go to a wine tasting with some friends. You went to a friend's house and there happened to be wine there. 
that's not the same event, right? So mm. if you can't go to your friend's house and not eat crap or drink or whatever the thing happens to be, you probably need to examine what's going on. So getting people to review that and in like the, so you asked about how people come into my program before it's 12 weeks and there's a ton of habit building and like investigation into yourself basically about what you're thinking when you eat, where you notice you're eating, what your emotions are like. Like, do you eat in your car, for instance? You know, mm. like, like how does eating in your car make you feel? It makes you feel crammed and distracted and maybe even a little bit dirty. And you're like, well, okay, so what, why would you choose to spend your meal times like that? Like what else could you be doing instead? Or, or how could you, if you're so hungry, you had to eat in your car, what could you have done before that to make a choice that was a better choice for food where you would have enjoyed it more in a better environment with higher quality food rather than grabbing a cheeseburger on your way home. And, you know, by the end of the 12 weeks, you can really see the change in people. But then if they choose to go from like a high accountability program like that, just a basic, oh, I just need training advice now, not the diet stuff, I guarantee they'll fall off it. Because while 12 weeks is great, and again, some people can flick the switch and change easily in that time most people will slowly revert back to what they were doing before because they got 40 years versus 12 weeks it's pretty hard for 12 weeks to beat 40 years yeah um the environmental side of things is huge i think like whether it's just the people in your environment but also just the the food triggers uh i, I actually went off alcohol almost two years ago now and the only place I got shit for not drinking was in Italy <laughs> like everyone else is like yeah no problem it's really funny um but well, it, it is like... weird like I, I've I've had customers go to business meetings and order like you know like a chicken salad or a steak and vegetables like like a, a, a good choice for eating out and water and people give them a hard time but I said to them like imagine you'd gone to that meeting with a bucket of KFC and a six pack of beer do you reckon anyone would have said anything? And because fat shaming is such a big deal now, no one would have said a word because they would have been scared to be like called out for insensitivity or, I don't know, bigotry or whatever. But you can fit shame someone and make fun of them for doing something healthy for themselves. But again, that's not the that, that's not the actions of someone who's your friend. You don't have to worry about their, their comments after that because you know they're just trying to undermine you for whatever reason happens to be in their head. Yeah, I've never, I've only ever worked in a, like a workplace with colleagues. Uh, I was teaching English in Thailand for like two years, but it's the amount of people that just in a workplace, their colleagues just bring in junk every day. And there's just, it's, it's a really, like, I was really su surprised by the culture. Like, it's pretty much like, you know, in Australia it was the same, in Ireland it's the same. Um, oh, and think about like the office birthday cake culture right yeah i mean if you work in a big office it's someone's birthday every day of the year like you, know, you can't <laughs> yeah. avoid five servings of cake a week but you know i tell people like you've got a relationship with these people just the same as you wouldn't expect your wife or kids to read your mind you've got to communicate with them because as much as they love you they don't know what your goals are unless you tell them same thing happens to go for people you work with and i had this conversation with a client this week who's been traveling a lot and he's saying oh you know because you know i've been traveling it's hard to eat well i'm like mate i've been in a lot of restaurants around the world and even airport restaurants they all serve salad or like a chicken or salmon and vegetables kind of deal like like don't tell me there's no even mcdonald's serve salads like yeah. there, there's healthy options everywhere right so i said but if you're worried about and there's two sides certainly from a work perspective like if you're i don't know about to sell millions of dollars worth of something to someone and it's a lunch meeting to like finalize things and sign contracts or whatever and the guy orders a, a palmer and a pot if you're Australian. So like a chicken parmigiana and, and, and a glass of beer and you order your chicken salad and water. You don't want that guy to feel like you're judging him because of, of your choices. So actually maybe in that situation, it is better to have a palmer and a pot because it's actually going to make that relationship better because the history of humankind is we share food together. We go out, we hunt woolly mallards and then we celebrate it and we share it together. That's how we strengthen social bonds, right? But under normal circumstances, maybe you just out with some colleagues and it's like an informal team meeting kind of thing and people start giving you a hard time where you say, hey guys, like on previous work trips away, I've gone home 10 pounds heavier, feeling awful, you know, and I'm really trying to change that and I'd appreciate your support. 
And at that point, because you've put the line in the sand, you know that anyone who has a go at you at this point is not on your side, right? Like you've asked for help to do something healthier and beneficial for yourself and they're giving you a hard time. That's not your friend. You don't have to worry about anything they say from now on and you know exactly who that person is. But you'll find the vast majority of people firstly don't care about what you eat once you've explained why you're doing it. And then there'll be an equally small number as the people who who try to undermine you who are actually active supporters of you and will help you out and be on your side and say, yeah, me too. I'm trying to lose weight. Let's do it together. And, you know, but the vast majority of people just won't care. But you can't expect them to know what you're you're trying to do if you don't communicate. You have to let them know. And then you'll see where they fall in that spectrum. Yeah, most people don't care. That's such an important point. Most of the stories are in your head as well. And like, and other people are telling themselves that story as well. So I can guarantee people who are thinking that way will say, hey, actually, you know, I'm not a big fan of whatever, eating crap when we're on the work trip. Three or four other people who are afraid to say something will probably jump in then. Oh, me too. Yeah, I just didn't yeah. want to make people feel, well, feel uncomfortable. And, and, and I think there's this, this idea that somehow it's a treat to eat poorly while you're away. You're like, like mm -hmm. yay. It's, it, I'm like, but it mean, means you sleep worse. You're less productive at work. You feel awful. You're grumpy. Like, how is that a reward? And actually, you're you're there to work. Someone's paid you to go away and do this thing. And you've actually deliberately chosen to make yourself less effective. Like, and that was I, I, one of the other parts of the strategy. I said, you know, like, along with the, I'm sick of going home feeling awful. Say, so, you know, I, I'm paid to be on this trip. I'm trying to maximize my productivity. I find I'm way more productive when I eat more sensibly at night and I don't drink and I can go and, and sleep properly and arrive at the work site fresh and, and really ready to go tomorrow and maximize why I'm here. And hopefully if you're on the right team, you'd, you'd be sat around a table at that point with everyone else going like, yeah, absolutely. Like, yeah, that, that's what I should be doing too. Yeah. I work with a tech company in Ireland. We do corporate wellness with them and they're really, you know, high powered guys and, and girls in the company um and we were just talking about that like if you they were saying like oh there's snacks on site and i was like if you guys because they have control they're all the upper level management i was like like the amount of money that's on the table here because you're you're potentially tired and lethargic like if you got your snacks and just put that in the company budget that could be worth like millions like and i think a lot of people don't mm. think about that like from a productivity standpoint in particular if you're you know very much um, making very very important decisions like your food is just it's such a no-brainer that will will get a massive uh, i used ROI. to be part of a business networking group in in quite in brighton which is quite a wealthy suburb in melbourne mm. and um the breakfasts were basically croissants and pastries and like you are aware that that carbohydrate makes you sleepy, right? So all you guys who came here to network and do deals and all this stuff, like you've just made it way harder for yourself. You guys need to pull out like some eggs and some jerky and like like uh, cottage cheese, like high protein things because protein actually wakes you up first thing in the morning. Like rather than than dose yourselves up with caffeine to counteract the high carbohydrate breakfast you just had, just ditch the carbs first thing in the morning. I mean, and from a real productivity point of view, I'm sure you've done some fasting. You know, when you've got no food in your stomach and none of that blood flow is being sent to the stomach, it's all going to your brain and really oxygenating your brain like crazy, how clear-headed are you? Like if you really want to maximize productivity at a, at a networking work function, no food. Don't let them eat all day long. I guarantee <laughs> yeah, they'll yeah. be super productive. Yeah, so true, man. I want to touch on, like, obviously with the summit, we've got the physical side of things, the emotional side of things, and the financial side of things, because they're the the three big areas that people, you know, that's going to make or break yeah. you big time over, over the long term. Um, I'd like to touch on that, which you made, like, from a financial side of things, because you're self-employed for a long time now. And when we talked on the last episode, like, was it 80% in five years? Most small businesses are gone. I think yeah, that was the, yes, the stats. Yes, 70 or 80%. For personal training, it's 70%. So personal training is is 10% is per year. And then at five years, instead of it being 10%, it's 70%. So, you know, if you go from 100 down to 90 in the first year, then you go to 81 in the second year, and then you're going to lose, uh, what are you, 73 in the third year down to what is it 65 in the next year i think and then suddenly you lose 70 percent of that so you're gonna lose another 
40 something percent of what's left you're down to less than 20 percent roughly of who you started with mm. at the the five year mark so yeah the attrition rate for any small business is super high yeah so i you know also just from from my own side of things like just to really think more long term into 50s 60s and beyond what advice do you have on the the financial side of things because obviously when you're i remember when i first opened my business in melbourne i was like oh wow this is all my money. I've got a thousand dollars. Great. Uh, this is amazing. <laughs> and then I was like, oh shit. I yeah, see like 30% of that to the government. And, oh yeah, my God. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> you know? I, I, I've just come back from Nepal and the Nepalese guide company were like, oh, we pay so much tax. And you know, if you can pay us in some cash, that would be really helpful. And I yeah. said, how much tax do you, and Nepal's very corrupt, right? Like, like super corrupt. And, and there's, uh, Australia has way too many government officials. Nepal's actually got more. So, you know, like like every layer of government, they've got their hand out asking for bribes, basically, and payoffs. But I said, you know, how much tax are you paying? They're like, oh, 13%. I was like, oh, 30? And they said, no, no, one, three, 13%. Wow. I was like, you guys should shut up because that's, that's fucking a tax awesome. Haven. <laughs> yeah, yeah, like, like we pay 10% GST. I pay 30% company tax. I pay on a fair whack of the money I earn about 50% in personal income tax. Like you guys should be quiet if you're only paying 13% tax. That's an awesome deal. Yeah. yeah. But look, the when I was younger, so like when I was about 20 or 21, my dad gave me this book called Richest Man in Babylon. And it's, it's probably fallen out of favor now. The other big one at the time was a book called Rich Dad, Poor Dad, which was basically about, uh, getting started property investing was the main premise of it but not being in a situation where the things that you think are assets are actually liabilities because obviously your mortgage is a liability your car lease is a liability and so all these people think they've got these assets but really what you've got is a drain on your bank account but richest man in babylon basically says pay yourself so at, you know using your thousand dollars as an example take a hundred of that and put that straight in your bank account and now whatever's left now you can work out the rest from there. And so I have done for nearly my entire career, I've taken 10% out of the money I earn and that goes into savings for myself. So separate to what I might pay myself. So I pay myself as well. Um, and I also take, and this is something that a lot of small business owners don't do, is I pay superannuation, which if you're listening from America, that's your 401k, that's your retirement fund. In Australia, it's compulsory anyway. It's a bit weird when you're a like a sole owner of a business, you can get away with not paying yourself and the government somehow says that's okay. But if I had staff, I would have to pay this money for the staff. But so I take 10% again of the money that I earn and it goes straight into my super. And I do that twice a month. So on the 15th of the month and on the 30th of the month, I go through all my customer payments for the last two weeks. I add it up and I take 10%, it goes into savings, 10% goes into superannuation. And, and obviously I'm paying myself at the same time. So, you know, as opposed to most small business owners, not only am I putting away 20% in both savings and superannuation every two weeks, but I'm making sure I pay myself. And a lot of, I remember when I was, I used to own a cafe and the purchasing process is very difficult because so many businesses aren't showing what they really earn on the books. And they're like, oh yeah, well, the books say it's 60,000 profit, but you know, it's 160,000 profit. And, you know, you come and stand by the till and count the money and you'll see. And and they think, though, because they've got, I don't know, 500 bucks cash that they've stolen from the tax man in their pocket at the end of the week that they're doing okay. But when you actually go through everything, they're basically on subsistence money. You know, like these people would struggle to get a car loan. They would struggle to go get a mortgage for it. Like if they wanted to buy a second house, they, they would struggle. And no bank will give you a loan based on what your uh your suspected earnings are they'll only mm. use your profit and loss thing and that was another thing for me to learn because you know like i had staff who wanted to be paid cash i had suppliers who wanted to be paid cash and i mean you know i'm not getting paid um uh, i i can't pay my bills in, in terms of like rates and electricity and stuff like that you can't pay them cash so you know everything has to go into the bank account and took me ages to even find suppliers for instance who were prepared to work honestly but you know all my staff were and i couldn't believe because i had staff who'd been in hospitality for like 20 years and 
I was their first employer who'd actually paid them properly ever. So as in like they, they got an award or above award wage, they got superannuation, they got holiday pay because of where my my cafe was right near Melbourne Uni. So there was just no point being open like over Christmas, for instance, because the city was dead. There were no students there. Like to open up used to cost us about 700 bucks a day. So even just me and one staff member, we would have been in debt for a day. So we'd mm -hmm. close over three weeks and then get one other week of holidays. They got sick pay, like all the actual pay conditions. And so many people in small business are operating without these basic things that are, are just normal employment conditions for any other business. But for some reason, small business operators feel like they don't need to treat themselves as well. And I think, you know, when we talk about mental health and sort of different behavioral things, like if you had a staff member who came along and said, oh, you know, my, my dad's dead. Can I get the day off? And you said, no, like, uh, hopefully you leave because you don't belong in business anymore. Like, like that, that's a horrible thing to do to someone. If someone came to you as a staff member and said, oh, you know, I'm a fat, lazy shit and, you know, I really need to do better. Hopefully you would be far more compassionate with them than they're being with themselves. But it also means that you shouldn't treat yourself like that. It, it, you know, as a small business owner, you should be able to take time off as a small business mm. owner, like, cause everyone's better after holidays, but as a small business owner, you should pay yourself properly as a small business owner. You, you should remember that the first person, the business needs to serve is you. So you've obviously got to provide a service to your customers at a fair price that they agree with and, and deliver value and all that kind of stuff. But if you're not being treated well by your business, just like a disgruntled staff member, you're going to leave. And, and, and I think with personal training, that's a great example because the early years are very tough. Developing yeah. clientele to begin with to make a decent amount of money is very hard. It's super competitive. There's, you know, in Australia, there's like 30, 35,000 personal trainers to compete against. So, you know, like like making a decent wage to begin with is hard. And how long are you going to stick at a job when at the end of every week after you've paid your rent and put petrol in your car and bought food and stuff like you've got like 20 bucks in your bank account? that's not an inspiring job to stay at. Yeah. And so obviously after a period of time, because every personal trainer is basically their own small business owner, even if they're working in a fitness first where they're paying rent, like that's your business, they're going to leave. There's no incentive to stay because it's a horrible position to be in. So uh, until you actually start treating yourself better, and obviously there's some business practices there that allow you to make more money and get more clients and things like that. But if you're not being treated well as a staff member of your own business, how incentivized are you to stick with it and make a success out of it? Yeah, I think that's the big thing that happens with PT. You're like, oh, I'm making like minimum wage, but I'm working five to nine a.m. and like four to nine p.m. So I can just I, I, work I can nine to now, five so instead. My cafe uh, was a struggle from when we bought it because. Obviously, the previous owners knew something was up, which is why they sold out of it. But there was an office building across the road, like on one, I was on a corner and across one of the other corners was a, a big building that had about four or 500 holes, which is a major supermarket brand employees in it, like data entry accounting people. So that was like their, their main accounting data entry branch for all of Australia, right? They moved. They moved to Coles headquarters, which was about 20 kilometers away and worked in-house rather than rent this place. And then that was empty for two years until Melbourne Uni took it over and started putting some, again, some data entry computer people in there. But that meant that at Christmas time, all my staff were getting holiday pay. They were all getting, you know what I mean? Like, like all my staff were getting paid normally. And I remember having about 50 bucks a week over one particular Christmas and be like, holy shit, like I'm, I'm working like 60 hours a week at this place, plus training people at the same time. Like I am busting my ass to make this a success. I'm getting 50 bucks a week equivalent over Christmas time. This is not a good business to be in. And that was the process of starting to get out of it and sell it because I, I just realized that you can't do 60 hours a week for 50 bucks a week. Like it's pretty miserable to have no money over Christmas. Yeah. That's actually something I'd like you to touch on, mate. Are you, how are you on time? Do you need to? No, I'm good. Need to jump. Okay, great. Um, PT, it's always a really challenging period with two, three weeks, uh, even Australia even more with summer. Um, people go away, people go on holidays. How? What advice do you have for someone who's maybe in person or it's having, happening to them online? I found online that's kind of solved that problem for me, which is amazing. 
Um, yeah, online solves it completely. Yeah, it's so good. Yeah, so, so uh, online, my customers get told when they sign up, there are no holidays as far as I'm concerned. Like you can mm -hmm. go away, but you're still going to get some training while you go away. It's, a, it's your choice whether you do it or not. It's nothing massive because the goal is not to in, increase fitness while you're away. The goal is just to not lose everything while you're away. So it's like 20 to 30 minutes a couple of times a week, just enough to like keep the wheels rolling. When I had my gym, that was a real problem. I mean, I would get people come to me like mid-December and say, okay, so like when school holidays starts in a week, I'm going to be off till the end of January. I'd be like, yeah. what do you mean? Like, like uh, I've got to pay $5,000 worth of rent next month and I've got three people to pay it with because everyone else is suspended. Like, are, are you kidding me? And when I, and I used to shut down for two weeks over Christmas and that made it even worse. And so then I realized like, I can't take holidays at Christmas time. I have to stay open and we would run like a holiday timetable for group PT. Um, but it was a real problem with that. And online has certainly fixed it. I think if I were doing in-person now, I would say that there's no suspension. You just like, you're basically paying for a year of private, like membership to a private club and it, your choice whether to attend the private club or not. But I wouldn't even allow people to suspend unless it was for medical reasons or something these days. I, I'd say I'm happy to provide a holiday program for you and you can do it while you're away, but there's there's just no suspensions. You're paying for a year of access to this place. Yeah, I think that would be really the way to go. Also, just having an app that they can use as well, something like that, so they're getting yeah, access to everything. Yeah, I think, like, everything. look, if you're... and and hopefully people listening who are PTs are good at their job. If you're good at your job, you're already running a boutique service, right? Like you're a step above being a trainer who is, um, you know, like paying rent at an anytime fitness or a 24 hour fitness or whatever it happens to be. Like, like you're above that already because you've got your own location. You're, you know, you're a genuine business owner. Now you might have some staff like, that's already a relatively high end service, you know, and, and you probably didn't open that as a day one PT. So you, you've made it through that like five year problem basically. And, and, and you're now into the, the section of our industry. That's actually very, very small percentage. You can start to treat yourself like an exclusive business. And I think there's always, like I remember when I started and this is quite a long time ago, uh, but I decided I should charge a hundred dollars an hour for personal training and it took me a couple of months to even believe that I was worth charging $100 an hour. But weirdly, at $100 an hour for one-to-one, -one, the results went through the roof because people really associated a lot of value with it. So they started really listening to what I was saying, made me look like a super trainer. I wasn't saying anything different. It's just they were listening more. And then I got more customers. I can put my price up even more. And you know, if you're in that situation and you're able to charge more money and you've got this boutique specialized service and you've got more experience, you can start to treat yourself like an exclusive club. You've just got to believe that you really are. And, but, and, and you've only got to walk into, I mean, go to like a local council gym, like a YMCA or something like that and have a look at the standard of training in there. And you will see that you really are a high level service and start treating your business like that. And if you think about, I don't know, like the way airlines you know like have have uh business class and they have uh frequent flyers and they have these like little exclusive clubs even within their customer pool that's what a boutique pt studio really is is the business class version of personal training that's a premium service and you can, you can dictate the terms however you want from there yeah it's i think it's for me that was that like the hardest part was literally seeing the value in my services actually for, for people who are yeah so hard at the start and i actually found getting coached by someone was really helpful to actually see all the benefits i was receiving from another trainer and i was like oh wow like i'm i'm getting all these benefits and i'm a coach so now i'm kind of seeing the value that i'm giving to my clients as well that was like helpful to kind of break yeah. through that yeah i mean and i think you know particularly when you get coaching from someone else you look and you go like, and I've had plenty of coaches and there've been times where I go like, holy cow, I'm paying this guy double what I charge. And yet I'm better at this than he is. And so you start to go, okay, like if, yeah. if this is what the standard is and this is what it's worth, like I can absolutely charge more than this because I can 100% do at least this much value for someone. Yeah. My buddy, he's, um, 
he's in Portugal now, but he had a very, very successful gym in Ireland. And then he sold it, I think, in 2018. Um, but he he's very good at sales. And he was just like, you know, it's not about the hour. It's like I'm giving that person years of health span, you know, and, you know, time with their kids and not worrying about their back pain. And then the, you know, well, you know the value you know the joke, right? is, like a guy comes up to Picasso in a restaurant and says, you know, like, like, I'm such a big fan of your work. Would you be able to draw me something? And Picasso pulls out a napkin, grabs a pencil, and you know, like, like sketches this thing. It's unmistakably a Picasso, and hands it to the guy. Goes, that'll be thirty thousand dollars. And he goes, what are you talking about? It only took you seconds. He goes, no, it took me fifty years. Yeah, I love that. That's so good. Yeah, and that's what you pay for. You pay for someone to be able to see yeah. something that's yeah. going to solve and that's, your problem. I, I, I think for trainers, that's the big distinction between online, like real online, like not that stupid thing where people do like zoom sessions with people, mm. because that's no different to just being there in person. You're still trading time for money, but once you get past that and you're essentially programming and advising and you can do it. I mean, I, I worked when I was in Nepal recently, as long as I've got an mm. internet connection, I can work. I've worked by a pool in Bali. I've worked in Thailand. I've, you know what I mean? Like, like I don't work anyway. Um, and you're not trading time for money and people start to realize that it's not about how many hours you spend working on their stuff each week it's it's the result they're getting that's what they're paying for and when you can believe in that then you can really start to charge a lot more and my experience has been when you charge more because people listen better it, it actually just builds on itself it's a really powerful thing at that point yeah those who pay pay attention um the last thing i'd like to talk to you about andrew is the taking time off this is something I've definitely struggled with, like over the years, like if I take time off, th there'll be issues maybe when I go back or come back or, you know, lead flow will stop and everything like that. What advice do you have for, you know, having set times in the year? How, how do you uh, set that up yourself? Well, so we don't, I, we don't have set times or I don't have set times. My wife is a firefighter. Her holidays are very rigid. In the terms of like, like I could go on her roster and I could look at when her holidays are going to be in five years' time. So we can plan things out really well. Um, there'll certainly be some holidays that you look at and you go, eh, nothing much can happen there. You know, like just the time, the weather's not going to be good, or we we'll just we won't do anything that one. But this other one over here, we'll we'll plan something here. Um, so we can plan things a long way out in advance. As I said, I can work from anywhere. So I've had, I mean, in the last twelve months. In April last year, I went, I actually, let's start January last year. In January last year, I went to New Zealand to climb for about 10 days. Um, we went to Nepal for my honeymoon in at the start of April for a couple of weeks. We then went back to Nepal in September for about three weeks. We went to New Zealand to climb again for about two weeks in February this year. We've just come back from Nepal again. The trip was cut short because I actually, you know, I got so sick I had to get helicopter rescued, which is a little oh, bit. Oh, man. Like, it, if you're so sick, you need to call an ambulance, which is all the helicopter is. You're really sick. So, like, I, I've never been that sick before. So, that was a little bit scary at altitude, particularly mm. because I got the flu, uh, influenza A, which is quite severe, but that can turn into pneumonia and, and, pleurisy and high altitude uh yeah high altitude pulmonary edema which basically means you're going to drown so like fairly serious stuff getting better now but but i can work while i'm away so while i have away periods i might only be away from work because of internet for two or three days at a time so how i structure it is i obviously tell my customers i'm going away hey if you've got a trip where you're going away and i need to put in hotel workouts I need you to let me know so I can structure it all in. I program them up with best guesses for that period of time. And obviously I'm still able to communicate with them while I'm away. So I can, I can't actually change the programs while I'm away off my phone, but I can communicate with people and say, oh yeah, I can see on Wednesday, for instance, I said to do this, but maybe do this other thing instead. And so I, I can still communicate with them. I can see their programs. Um, and I've got it to the point where I can probably do it's definitely less than an hour, but probably somewhere between 30 and 60 minutes every other day while I'm away. And I mean, it's so good. Uh, I, I didn't block my calendar out while I was away. I completely forgot. And I came back. And so I'm not supposed to be back till the 10th of May. And I had a customer who had booked a call with me yesterday. And 
he didn't even know I was away. So that's how good the process can be online mm. these days. Like he wasn't even aware that there was any real interruption in service. He's in Melbourne as well. He thought I was still just at my house, like responding to everything as normal. So um, while I can't have complete holidays yet, uh, I, from a customer service point of view, I, there's no real interruption. In terms of your advertising and leads, um, I'm, I am running a Facebook ad and Instagram ad at the moment. I just mm. paused it. We've started up again on Monday, so only a couple of days ago, and it's obviously works exactly the same as as it was when I turned it off. So, um, you know, now I'm back and, and running. That's back up and running, and that process has started instantly again. So there's a period of, what is it, like three weeks where there were no brand new leads coming in, but that's as simple as turning it on. So um, th that process happens overnight. And then do you ever take like, okay, you know, seven days or two weeks, like I'm just off the grid, like you're up climbing and you're not, um, you know, you're just completely plugged the, out the, or? The, weirdly, so New Zealand has better internet than Australia. Yeah. So Australian internet is, is pretty archaic and, and prehistoric, but New Zealand's got faster internet, but you've got no service when you go climbing in New Zealand but you can be in the middle of nowhere in Nepal at 5,000 meters and have internet that's just as fast as Australia. So, that's so funny. <laughs> it, 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 it is. It, I mean, because like you'll, you'll be in this shack where like they're not even burning wood in the fire. They're burning yak dung because there's no <laughs> spare wood growing at 5,000 meters to cut down to make firewood. So they're burning yak dung. They're cooking everything off, off like big gas bottles, like a big barbecue, basically. Like, yeah. like it's as, and, and, and it, it's not like there's, a phone there's like internet's like phone service is not there but internet is because they've got satellite um they've got no fresh water there's no sewerage there's electricity that uses solar that comes on about four o'clock in the afternoon like like there's nothing but the internet works and it works just as fast as australia which is so weird but you go yeah. to new zealand which has actually got around town like if you stayed in a hotel in new zealand you would have cracking internet like super high speed compared to australia but you've got no access to it just you know like, like on relatively low hills just close by so um that actually is full time off and and when that happens i will tell people like hey i'm going to be completely out of service from this period to this period and obviously you know their programs are all done and stuff like that and look i think one of the advantages with working with older people is they understand like mm -hmm. most of them are in more senior positions. They certainly understand the benefit of holidays. They know everyone needs time off to not burn out and stuff like that. So everyone tends to be very supportive of actually taking full time away. Um, and while I could do more, I mean, the, the other side of it is, you know, you're in a service business. I do charge quite a, a large amount for what I do. Um, and I don't want to take the piss and abuse that, that faith that the customer is putting me. So um you know, like this year, maybe later this year, I'll have six or seven days in New Zealand where I'll have no service. So total for the year where I'll be completely out of service will only be like 12 days for the year. Mm -hmm. Yeah, got it, mate. Awesome, man. Well, look, uh, I really enjoyed just just getting, I think it's from, from my side of things, it's just awesome to get such great advice from someone in your position and I can, it's really helping me and I'm sure it's going to help a lot of other people, trainers in, in particular, listening to this. Um, what's the best place for people to find out more about you, what you do and, and everything that you offer from a service standpoint? It is www.peakperformance40, peak, P-E-A-K, performance40.com. And my Facebook page is Andrew Reed. So there's a public figure page. Um, just one thing on business, and I've had this discussion quite a bit. I met this guy on a previous trip to Nepal who's super high-level entrepreneur, like like has built and sold multiple businesses that sold for 10 plus million dollars. So the guy's like 60 years old and permanently retired now, never needs to work again. Um, super interesting, very smart guy. And he said to me, because people start with the wrong thing. Like if you look at like PTDC, for instance, Personal Training Development Center run by John Goodman, yep. his big thing is he asked like, what's your, what's your, your number? Like, like what's the amount of money for you to be happy, for you to be able to be comfortable? Like that's the wrong question. That's a question. But the most important question that any new business owner should be asking is what's my exit strategy? 
right? Mm. Like, like, so why am I peak performance 40.com and not Andrew Reed PT? Because I can't sell Andrew Reed PT, right? Like in 10 years time, when I want to retire, if I try to sell the business, no matter how successful it is, without me attached to my name, that thing is worthless, right? So first thing is start thinking about uh, if I'm going to do this for a long time, how do I get out of this? Because if you've built a business, like if you sold, I don't know, like like plumbing or if you sold tires or whatever, you'd work that business, build it up. And at some point when you went to retire, you would sell that asset, right? And a personal training business is no different. So you've got to think about what your exit strategy is. And then you can work your way back to, I want to earn this much money. This is how many customers I need. This is how many PT sessions I need to sell, all that kind of stuff. But you've got to start with what the very end goal is, which is how are you going to get out of this with the most money possible? And people aren't asking that question when they set up their PT business. They're just going, oh, well, I, I like training people. And, you know, like if I charge 60 bucks a session, then that means I can make like $1,200 a week. And that's all good stuff. But you've got to start with this end result question first. If you don't know what your exit strategy is, all the rest of it's a waste of time. That's such a good uh, thing to think about, man. My business is Conor O'Shea Fitness. So, uh so that's yeah. Uh, well, yeah, and I was really PT good. for a long time, and yeah. then then I realized, like, about two years ago, I was like, "Holy shit, I've got nothing to sell. I yeah. I got to fix this." And then I ran into this guy, and he confirmed it, and I came straight home and changed my business name. Uh, yeah, that's definitely something I'm going to think about. Yeah, I have a kind of strong for life is kind of the the brand we'll say. Well, there so you go. Strong. Yeah, strong for life. That, that, that's that's good. You can sell that, right? <laughs> yeah. And even I went, I, I've gone through periods of time where I've bought, um, you know, domain names. I've got like about 20 different fitness names that are all good potential names. And as I've gone, oh yeah, that's, that's not for me now. And that's not for me. And that's not for me. You let them go, but they're so cheap to buy. And, mm. you know, like obviously the longer you wait, the less likely you are to find a decent name that no one else has grabbed. So if you come up with something that's available, just buy it. They're like 200 bucks a year. So yeah. They store them all up. And if you don't need them later, that's cool. Let them go. But mm, maybe have a think about not naming it after yourself. Yeah, man. Uh, yeah, dude, like just so many gems again. <laughs> really appreciate it. And um, yeah, we'll definitely do some round round twos or round three later this year. Okay. Yeah, super, super. Awesome.